Welcome to a magnificent journey into the past. Let the games begin! Hey guys. Are you prepared for a night of feasting and sport the likes of which you will never forget? Yes! Thanks for watching. I've been doing a lot of thinking about the issue of the thousand years and the middle ages <laughs> if you watch monty python's work monty python is the amalgamation or conglomeration of several comedians including john cleese and others that rumbling you hear in the background is my dog growling, not my stomach, this time. Just so you know. <laughs> I really can't control some of these things. If, if I tried to, I either need a studio or, or I just don't record videos because I just don't have that kind of time. But I do have time to do research and read and share it with you right now. If, well, that, see, there's that. Yes, intruder alert. Sometimes there's a, a little old lady. Uh, where I used to live, there was a little old lady that would go out and walk around her building. And uh, she had the whole get up, you know, like a hat, a shawl, a veil, or not a veil. I guess that was the shawl. It's kind of like a scarf, but it's wimpier. And I think like a cane, not really a walker, but one of those walker-type canes. In a big old dowdy dress. And fluffy, frilly, all the granny stuff, you know. Like, like her, all of her stuff was made in a doily factory by crochet or embroidery whenever possible. And she would walk around so slowly, and the dog would just bark, bark at her like she was the frickin' intruder of the year or something. Like, and I, I kind of laughed about it. Like, what do you expect? Is she going to suddenly just break out like a '90s kids commercial? You know, like a cereal commercial where the granny starts doing cartwheels and flips like a ninja you know that's kind of what what must have going been going through my dog's mind so anyway i mean other people she wouldn't bark at as much whatever the case oh i just as another a little aside i happened to come across a video where there was a woman in Oregon, the state of Oregon in the West, and she was walking out doing a check as a, a naturalist, and she came across a wolf, a lone wolf, I guess, and, and she described her experience, which there's nothing much to it. It just, it stumbled upon her, and she had to kind of go, hey, yo, and kind of wave her arms, because it was going to, like, walk into her. It hadn't detected her yet. I thought that was strange to begin with, but she said, well, the wind was blowing such a way that the wolf wouldn't detect her scent, and she was wearing kind of semi-camouflage clothing, and she was standing in some light brush. But you, in the, she had the video of the wolf on the approach, and it just kind of was trotting t towards her, and it had its mouth open, panting. It's looking, you know how they have, they have their mouth open, they're panting, but they also do that so they can smell, or they can their sense of smell is better. And it's just trotting along, and it's looking left, right, left, right, like you would expect it to. And every once in a while, it would kind of look behind itself. And it wasn't alone, but it looked like it was alone at that point. It was just running its position. Maybe it was kind of young, but anyway, she had to alert it. It was going to run into her, and 
it stopped and it looked at her and then it ran the other way. I thought that a bit strange because I thought these creatures were way on top of things that they always would see you before you see them. Maybe not always, but in that case, this thing's walking right up to her, you know? And the thing I found really strange was she played recordings of wolves. Just bear with me for a second here can do things the way the proper way sorry for the click I'll edit that out if necessary so now I'm right on top of the mic and we'll try this audio out as well now where was I I was in the wilderness there was a wolf a wolf and, oh yes, so what I found really odd about it was the woman played some recordings of what she heard when the wolf went out of sight. It wasn't a lone wolf, it was traveling with companions, and it gave the distress call, or the warning call, which she said was a bark. And my, my ears perked up like a wolf would, you know, where you're kind of just kind of watching, kind of listening to a video while you're doing something else. And I kind of stop whatever I'm doing, brushing my teeth or whatever, and I kind of turn, hmm, what? Did she say bark? Because now I'll talk a little bit like a, William F. Buckley Jr. I was uh, under under the uh, the impression that wolves, in general, the canis species of wolf, uh, rather isn't known to bark, as it were. It was something that I knew for quite a while. I thought, well, it's weird. Like dogs usually don't howl. And wolves usually don't bark, but dogs come from wolves. So it was just one of these interesting things that is kind of an anomaly or interesting with respect to breeding and hybrids and genomes. The original subject was about the missing thousand years. And you, as you know, the missing thousand years, well, they're not, it's, it's not necessarily missing, although... When I went through that whole subject in a couple of videos, and primarily the one that has the thousand years in the title, I only touched upon the vast number of examples and reasons which brought on the line of thought. And I've had this, I've had these thoughts about the Middle Ages for <laughs> ages. And uh, apparently I'm not the only one to consider a number of theories, and I don't want to get into it. There are some people who claim ownership of ideas to kind of stake, out, stake it out on YouTube with, by, by planting a flag with a video that uh, if you see it or don't see it, or if somebody sees it and mentions it among 10,000 other comments, some people would expect the other creator to have done this research and pay homage to whoever popularized or spoke the theory in whatever terms in whichever video prior to your own. I, I don't really want to even get into that or address that. Um, you know, I tip my top hat to you, whoever came up with it first, but if I find out that somebody else mentioned it before you, I tip my top hat to them, and so on and so forth. It goes until we've all wasted our lives chasing around these accolades that aren't there. Because in this business, in this line of discussion, whereby we discuss things that are apparently controversial, um, 
given the connotation of all kinds of negative things that are counterproductive towards getting to the truth. And even beyond that now, there are people experienced, more experienced than I in this field of seeking truth. You know, and I don't even want to be pigeonholed as that. Like as a YouTube creator, I just, I just have fun, you know, and I just talk about whatever the heck I want to talk about. I have no, like, a, <laughs> agenda. I mean, the main thing that I do, because I do sense the responsibility that's associated with having a voice, having talent to one extent or another, I do recognize that responsibility to have a mission or an agenda, which is to personally, personally with myself, be the best person I can and to know God, to get to know Jesus and to make him known to others, to love and be loved, that type of stuff. Yada, yada, yada. Most important stuff in the world, though. At least my world. This is my world I'm sharing with you. And if you don't like it, you know, you don't have to watch. You can do what some people do and call me crazy or call me an idiot and just brush me off. You know, whatever. That's up to you. But what is up to me is what, the, what I talk about in this channel. And so on the subject of Middle Ages, the Middle Ages, the medieval times. This is medieval times! That's the from the cable guy. It's one of my favorite lines. The guy who delivers that line, Kevin something. He's a Canadian actor and he was one of the crew on the comedy like sketch show called The Kids in the Hall, which is pretty racy for a Canadian show to begin with, but also for the times it was what, like early or mid nineties. I don't know. I saw it in, I saw it like after the fact, like best of type stuff. And and some of it is really good. Like the guy who goes out in public, there's one, he goes out in public and he, he's like a loner, like a geek guy. And he looks around at like people watching, you know, like he's eating his lunch on a bench in the city or something. And he sees somebody goes, ah, what are you doing? You're shopping. Well, this will be your last day shopping. Cause I am going to crash your head. And then he puts his fingers out and from his point of view, you see his fingers like in front of the camera, you know, following the person along, like tickling them or whatever. And he goes, now I crash your head. And he's, he squeezes his fingers together on their head. I'm crashing your head. Just silly things like that. But some of it's very clever. Anyway, one of the top, one of the guys from that crew was the actor who was on The Cable Guy and played that part and just had the one line, Welcome to Medieval Times! And he's just so great. And it, I marvel at that when really, really, really great, talented people just have this one little part. They're capable of so much more. Well... The creativity of people, the ingenuity of people, that is something that is uh, practically practically something that can't be enumerated. If you try, if you look at patents, inventions, they date back to, like in the United States, I think the late 1700s, one of the first patent, I think, was... Uh, some kind of a kiln for making potash. A re, what was it? A refracting furnace, something like that. Anyway, it's I find it odd because, well, that's when they had the patent law. You go to England, you look at the patents, and they go back to around that time, you know. And and it is before 1850, but it the the number of recorded inventions and things drops off rather quickly. And all of a sudden, it's like. You get as you get towards the middle middle ages, medieval times, it just really, really drops down to almost zero. And almost all of the inventions at that point are rudimentary developments in the art of warfare and torture. <laughs> and you look into these things, and they're kind of nonsensical in the first place, and you just can't really see how that could ever be used. And you find out, well, that was symbolic, or it was a deterrent, or this, or that, or the other. Like, well, things you thought for sure. Well, like, that's how I am about canons. And I, I know it's still, it hasn't caught on. Global Vision kind of confirmed that. And 
the cannons, the, the way cannons are supposed to work, the way they're supposed to be used, and then you kind of think about it a little bit, and you're like, what the hell? Like, really? I don't know. Um, another example I can give, it's not Middle Ages, but it kind of goes along with that, is as far as the development and the art of warfare. Guns, I understand. I, I fired guns. I know how they work. Guns, I understand. Cannons, I, I can understand. Artillery guns, sometimes called cannons, but are they really cannons? I don't know. Well, one of the earliest, like, quote, guns is the blunderbuss. Now, if you look, if you watch uh, the TV show, as I do, called Pawn Stars, as in the pawn shop, okay, not porn, it's an A pawn, like, like the, the piece in the chess game, you know? Like our, our politicians turn out to be pawns. Pawns. Pawn stars. Rick, you know the guy who kind of laughs like... <laughs> it makes me cough to do it. Uh, that guy, he's kind of interested in history. Well, it seems like over and over again, one of the most recurring things that people are bringing into the show, at least the episodes I've watched, is, oddly enough, a blunderbuss. A blunderbuss. And a blunderbuss is like the Pirates of the Caribbean type it's a gun with the big, it has like a bell on the end, you know, like a horn, you know, like it's going to go, brant, but it's, it's supposed to be a gun. And then they claim, oh, you just, yeah, you just, just pack, pack some powder in there, some gunpowder and the wad. And you just rip some cloth off with your teeth, you know, and you just wad it up and spit on it. You'd be threatening me hearties and you push that wad down there. And then you just you just throw crap and broken glass and pebbles and iron chips and things in there and just jam that down in there. And then you hold out the gun and you pull the trigger. And they gave one to Chumley on the show. And oh, it's so dangerous because, well, it would be. I'll explain it in a minute. He pulls the trigger because they go to the shooting range and test these things out. He pulls the trigger and it you're used to it, you pull the trigger, a hammer comes down, and it fires, right? No, not the blunderbuss. Hammer comes down, and it maybe lights a fuse, and then the fuse burns for a while, and then it maybe ignites the gunpowder, and the gunpowder maybe explodes. Now, something I've watched, I, I lean in and pay attention now, especially, because when they're getting ready to fire it, they... <laughs> They talk about what kind of projectiles you could load in there, and they talk a lot about whatever grain gunpowder they use. And I, I'm not super, like, I'm not a gun nerd or anything. Like, I don't know, like, the grain, that's the charge amount, but then it depends on, like, the type of gunpowder and the type that they had back then was not as, whatever, it wasn't as potently explosive as what you can get today, of course. I, maybe not, of course, but apparently. And he, Chumley pulls the trigger, and then it, he's standing there, and he almost starts to like, oh, I guess it's a misfire, and then it goes off, right? But I watch closely, I lean in, and they don't, I don't see them actually load a projectile into it. Nor do they show, oh, this is what we're putting into it. Because I wanted to see, is it a, is it shaped like a bullet? Is it like what they were talking about? Just some, just go down, bend down, you know, in the desert, pick up some gravel, some cactus needles, yeah, anything you'd want to shoot into your enemy to give them a bad day. And broken glass is always mentioned. And I'm thinking, I don't know. I mean, supposedly with the wad, well, it's not, it's not a range weapon. It's not, and I know better. It's like, you know, I was into things about like middle the medieval times and the warfare and all that kind of stuff and knights and shining armor, all the fighting styles and uh, like all the like not so much samurai and that type of stuff, a little bit of that, but ninja stuff. But mainly, I kind of studied it because I like to find out what is the best and. Many years ago, I was already pretty keen on the notion that just because something is, quote, developed 
or modern. It does not mean it's better. And I think it's true as far as hand-to-hand -hand combat goes. I, I think, I'm, well, I'm pretty sure, based on technology, the best soldiers of today could defeat the best soldiers of yesteryear. But that's, that's something that has some caveats to it. And what I mean by that is the best soldiers of today, like SEAL Team 6 or the, the top Mossad agents, top, you know, the, the, the trained, the fighter types, you know, the, the goon, henchmen, hitmen types, you know. They are probably the best in the world, but maybe the best of all time. Probably, based on the technology that they have today. I don't know that for certain, but I haven't seen anything better. However, that is with the caveat that they are trained and equipped. And when I say equipped, I'm talking about the night vision, which requires batteries, the, the, the guns, which requires loading and cleaning and all this maintenance and then all this complicated technology to create. And if you strip them down in hand-to-hand, -hand, they are formidable. I do not know for certain that they are uh, indestructible or un un undefeatable compared to the other ones. It would be quite a fight, I'm sure, but I believe that the best warriors in traditional history, based on what we know is the Spartans, and of course they are from before even the Middle Ages, they were trained from a very young age, and I examined the weaponry of the Spartans in comparison to the weaponry of all these other uh, types of fighters, and I thought, you know, you really can't beat the Spartans. There's a reason, if the story is true, about Thermopylae and the 300 Spartans against the... Well, it was what? It was more than 300. I think it was really... Because they had help, but there were 300 Spartans and like a thousand other warriors against something like a hundred thousand or more of the, quote, immortals, the Greeks. And Anyway, the thing about the Spartans is their armor isn't too much. It's perfect. It's it, the shield. Their shield is so impressive. A Spartan with a shield could probably take out, like, let's say your average police officer today, even if they had a pistol, because the Spartan could approach them quickly and use the shield to deflect the bullets. It is a very good shield. Now, even if they pierce the shield, you know, the Spartan may still be able to advance and the shield could be used as a formidable weapon with a death blow in one strike. They also had these lances. I think they were called lances. They're longer than spears. And they had these short swords, which allow you to move your arm quickly. And yeah, so, I mean, they were just extremely formidable foes. And their armor seems reasonable, like you could wear it on a hot day and fight and not overheat. So, yeah, so you have that. Now, the advances from there, they're not really well explained. But let's look at some things, other things from the Middle Ages just for a minute, just to see what... It doesn't make sense, like the the castles. I visited some castles that are... Uh, I visited some in Switzerland, Italy, Germany, and France. And let me tell you, the stories they tell there are kind of comical. And you've seen it. You've seen the lore uh, that they would see there would be an attack upon the castle and the attackers would go up to the gate and, and then they'd have oiling hot water or hot oil poured down on them and they would stand there and let it get poured on them and then they just you know and do you think i mean do, do you think that really happened i mean honestly i don't know the other odd thing is you look at all these castles and, and there's a strong association europe castles europe castles I can show you castles near me. I can show you castles in the Midwestern United States, elsewhere in the Midwestern United States, and all over the place. There are castles everywhere. There are castles out the wazoo. 
around here. We don't give tours and make up stories about what happened in the past. We don't have that history, but boy, if some of them don't look about the same as what you see over in Europe. And then you look around elsewhere in the world and you find basically kind of the same castles. It's just like everything else. And they're not, some of them, some of them are hidden. Some of them are destroyed now. Some of them were found in ruins, like I did the video on upstate New York and how they were from the beginning, from the earliest records in the 1600s and 1700s. And then there's a dearth of those records, which means hardly any. And then after 1850, you have quite a few more. They all speak of these stone castle-like buildings. And uh, they refer to these things that were not built by the natives. And then the Native Americans said that they were there when they arrived. And who built them, they don't know, but they would they would have thought that it would be, have been the mound builders. And then there's the whole issue of the mounds. The mounds are thought to be very, it's just this, like everything else, temple tombs, temple tombs, temples of tomb, and tomb of temples, and and that people would expound such great effort to construct an architectural piece that looks like a pile. <laughs> it's, a, it's an architectural masterpiece of shite. It's just... Well, they're, they're probably just like collapsed buildings. Uh, if you want to see more about that, you can watch why, the Wise Up channel, and he does a pretty good job of explaining it. But you go to these mountains, and I'm of the thought sometimes that a lot of the mountains, hills, that I find it hard to believe they would be formed naturally by geologic processes that we see and experience today. They're more than likely debris piles from the cataclysm, the flood, or another cataclysm, or collapsed buildings, likely from... The flood or the cataclysm and whether that's their original location or not depends on the integrity of the structures so the middle ages yeah you look into anything there of what technologies they did develop and you just grab some off the top of your head that have been popularized like the iron maiden not the band the torture killing device because the middle ages the medieval times are associated with that their solution to every problem and their solution to everything that wasn't a problem if they could get it by they would use it as an opportunity to torture and kill because well, i don't know i don't buy it it's like when i was in college one of the most popular posters at the time was a like 50 reasons to party you know birthday and this is like, Pat, you took a test. You got an A. It's Friday. It's Wednesday. <laughs> it's Saturday. It's whatever. You know, the list goes on and on. It was just a joke. Ever, you're just looking for a reason to party because you want to party. Well, in the Middle Ages, it was that way with torturing and killing. Yeah, because, because that's what people wanted to do. That, they didn't have television, so they wanted to torture and kill people. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyway, the thousand years. Now, in the Middle Ages, if you look at any timeline, it just gets, it gets really scant. Unless it's a very specific subject where they have made a lot of stuff about it, like, ooh, well, like war, ah, not even warfare much. Um, I guess you could say, like, body armor. If you had looked at the timeline of body armor, I guess it'd be, there'd be more activity and developments in the Middle Ages than at other times. But for the most part, things just kind of drop off. Now, in reality, during that time, you see people, find, they start to realize like in the 1500s, I guess, somewhere, maybe the 1400s, I guess it's towards the end of the Middle Ages, they, they got this notion of making art on a canvas. Uh, before that, they just, hmm. 
well, we can make we can make the cramp out of a statue, and we can carve we'll carve in. Give me some. Give me a chisel and a hammer, and some blue meth, and I'm going to carve an entire fortress out of the side of a mountain. But no amount of blue meth can make me put together some artwork on a canvas. That didn't really make sense to me. And here's another thing that didn't make sense to me. But it might make sense now is you look at art and like modern art today is meant to disturb you and to make you feel like you're an idiot because it's so simple or so ugly or so plain or so boring. It's just geometric shapes or colors or it's thoughtless. It's meaning is so negative. It's, it's not, it's, it's like there's impressionism and then expressionism from like the Weimar Republic of Germany, that type of stuff that was disturbing, you know, they're expressing their, their negative emotions, and it's like, ugh, crap, ugh. Well, that, whereas modern art is more like that, you go back, and then you have, like, you have your Impressionist, you have your Renaissance art. Uh, it gets back into the 17th century art, and before, it becomes, like, religious-themed, and almost exclusively, and it depicts beautiful people People who seem to be like giants, and when shown within the context of the architecture, if it exists the, to this day, they seem sometimes to be large people with respect to the uh, surroundings ar- about them. And oddly enough, I went and checked that again, and I found information to support the point that I just made. But I also found information to the contrary, where they appeared to be we folk. And it blew my mind. i got to share that with you. That was from, uh, I think it was New Earth Channel. So it just, I, I, I didn't even know what to think about that. But I think there were people who were bigger than us and also people who were smaller. How that could it be, I, I guess genetic diversity. As, as time passes, the number of original, uh, the the number of genes in the original human genome overall is decreasing. That may not be at all of a bad thing, but it probably is because, at least with diversity and the original genetics, you can have the opportunity to bring anything out or bring anything back as practicable. As long as that's used for good, that's great. That's one of the reasons I'm against GMO, because it's introducing variation without improving the genome, and it serves to it serves to contaminate and sully the heirloom genes that have the information the in its most pure and perfect form as it as you go back in time. A few of you will get what I just said. I hope you do, because that's really important. But the subject for another time. But yes, the Middle Ages. Um, I'll take a little break and pick up. Okay, I'm going to stay focused here. The thousand years, thousand years, thousand years, all right? Thousand years. Missing? Maybe. It would make sense that it would be missing in some ways, such as the way that the depiction, the the number of examples where something says the year, let's say, 1510. You know, you can go around today, you can find buildings, you can find documents, you can find different things that say 1996. I probably have uh, quite a few of them in my house. It makes sense as you go back, things become less available, right? But you wouldn't expect it to drop off like a cliff where suddenly there's just like next to nothing on it. Nor would you expect to have it picked back up 
at another time. Continuity. There are continuity issues. Some of the family trees have continuity, like the royal family, going back through the Middle Ages. And I'm betting that you, if you're like me, or if you know anybody whose gene, genetic uh, or uh, what's the gene, genealogy is traceable prior to, let's say, 1850 or 1812, then you're in rare company to begin with, even if you're in Europe, even if you're <laughs> in China or someplace that has uh, family histories pretty well documented. It's actually probably quite rare. It is quite rare. Why is that? Well, various reasons. Now, we don't know exactly, but you get to the Middle Ages, almost nobody has... I mean, something so basic as, you know, your dad knows who his dad is. And his, his dad should probably know who his dad is. And that information should have been passed along. You know, look at all the different things we do pass along down the line. Uh, another thing would be like heirlooms, you know, it just, it just seems that there's so many clues pointing to uh, some kind of major change or cataclysm. So there's the theory of that the thousand years are missing and that is best supported by those types of evidences, but it's a, it's a negative proof, you know, it doesn't really work just because something isn't there doesn't mean that there wouldn't be any evidence. It's like, because somebody doesn't have an alibi, doesn't mean that they are guilty of the crime, right? And then, furthermore, you have to look at, is there a crime in the first place? But that's another story, because that, that's usually a problem. Anyway, uh, there is evidence, there is, and you'd think, well, there would be some culture out there that has an explanation or has a history that is continuous and that represents a different timeline with the thousand years uh, that aren't added. So, like, they could trace back to some worldwide event like the crucifixion of Christ and then the, in their timeline it would be only about a thousand years ago instead of two thousand years ago. And uh, that does exist over in India. And I've covered it before, and I don't recall the details at the moment because they were there were dis words, descriptors, names that I am quite unfamiliar with as far as etymology, and that is how I remember things, usually verbally. But the concept is there, and it's clear. It wasn't exactly a thousand years different, but it was close. I think it was at least 700 years that they have. So and by their count, by their translations, it would be about 700 years. And... There's a video I did that I took down because of a mistake I made, but it was the video on coins, and I still am planning on republishing that with the corrections. In that video, I cover this formula that they use to translate the dates on some supposedly ancient coins or older coins from around the Middle Ages time. And it stated a formula that included like 800 years where you would just use a certain year and then you like added, you like multiplied, what was it? You added a certain number of years to it to get the proper date, supposedly, according to our dating. And 
you know, they're just general questions like, what, when, why did we change our 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 text, our enumeration, our numerals? Why did we go from Roman numerals to the whatever they call it, whatever we use today, whatever that's called? You know, the numbers, the base ten digit system that we use. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and zero. Or according to Neil Armstrong, when talking about the keyboard that he had on the Apollo lunar lander, he said it had zero through ten. So that'd be a base eleven system. Anyway, there was a time, I think it was, 600 AD the Gregorian calendar like if you have a if you have a calendar that works would you change it oh it's the kings and they they well we have to we will mark the days according to my reign and that just seems so so impracticable and it seems like a a poor explanation it could just be from the confusion of the languages and that's another thing that um, where lang languages are coalescing we don't get new languages now they like to talk about how Klingon and Esperanto were made there's an elvish language made but get real you know um, the modern Hebrew, that's a revival of a language. There's, well, computer languages and things, but that's just an approximation, a symbolic representation of something else. Really, the number of languages, it's just decreasing. Or maybe it's steady, maybe it's constant at like a thousand. But at any rate, it seems, it seems to be according to the biblical timeline. Now, when I, I talk about the Bible a lot, but the, the Bible pretty much stops a number of years after, after the Apostle Paul. I think really the Apostle Paul is kind of the latest stuff in the Bible because the last book of the Bible, Revelation, was by... Apostle John, and then so that had to be authored, I don't know, before maybe 100 AD. Well, definitely before 100 AD. If you look at when it was supposedly authored, they always have a date later by a century or two than what it possibly could have been. It doesn't make sense. It never made sense to me. I don't even want to discuss it because it irritates me. Like the Gospels, they say, were written in three, two or 300 A.D. What the heck? It's the Gospel of the, the uh, Apostles. They were once disciples of Jesus. If Jesus was crucified 33 A.D. or 30, well, let's see, 34 A.D. I don't know. There's always a year. It's like a, there's no year zero. So is it one? Ugh. Like, why would it be confusing? It shouldn't be confusing. It should be, it's just like gender. It's like, it's like you start off. This is the one thing you know. It shouldn't be confusing, but it is. And maybe that's the key to understanding it is that it's not meant to be understood. It is meant to be confused because there's something hidden, something that you can't know. If you try to make sense of it, It'll drive you into madness. Well, anyway, back to what I was saying about Monty Python. They kind of get it. And if you watch, like, the Holy Grail, they point out the silliness of the Middle Ages. Um, it's kind of summed up in this one scene where, uh, I think it was the Holy Grail, and they could have been time bandits because they went to the Middle Ages too, but in the Holy Grail, there's just this lady in rags 
sitting in the dirt because it's the medieval, it's the dark ages and and there was daylight, but she's holding a cat by the tail and she's whapping it against a tree and it goes Row! every time. And she has you know, like three teeth showing and just some haggard old hag sitting in the dirt, whapping a cat against the tree. Because what else are you going to do in the Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages, in the medieval times? You could, you could be tortured or torture. You could die or kill. Or you could sit in the dirt and whap a cat against the tree. You know, that's just like, unless you're nobility, those, that's pretty much what you had to be, unless maybe a farmer. And then there's a scene where they encounter a farmer, and the farmers were supposed to be illiterate, ignorant, fools, idiots, just superstitious knobs. But Monty Python is so great. They, they encounter the farmer, and the farmer is just sharp as a tack. And he just shreds them based on logical arguments and and bemoans the state of politics and <laughs> things like that makes total sense and just is like a debate master <laughs> and makes a fool of uh, King Arthur the character. Then you have... Um, the, the clergy and the holy hand grenade, all this great stuff. And, but in Time Bandits, they go to the Middle Ages for a bit, and they look around, and they kind of see a knight in armor on a horse, and that type of thing, and they look around, and there's someone, I don't know, drinking mead or eating a turkey leg or whatever. And, oh, we're in the Middle Ages. Well, when in the Middle Ages? I don't know. I can't tell. It probably doesn't matter. We're, just, we're in the Middle Ages, medieval times. <laughs> And that kind of tells you right there, too. And my favorite scene is from the Holy Grail movie, where this historian who loves war, he finds himself kind of transported back, or he intersects with that, and this knight on a horse rides by and slashes him dead with his sword, because that's all that happened back then anyway. So that's what would happen to the historian if he visited his beloved time. So what is it? Well, I guess we don't know, but we'll get into it. But we're out of time for now. Thanks for listening. And we will reach some conclusions. Maybe you can put some um, ideas in the comments. I have my own thoughts I will share. And we can stake out our claims and plant flags and fight each other for ownership of the ideas that will solve it all. Or we can just have a good time talking about it and have some fun thinking about it. It's your choice. You know what I think. And I like you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. And if you are supporting the UAP channel via Patreon, the ad revenue, if I do run ads on a video, sometimes others do, whether I like it or not, they do because I use clips and scenes and things and it makes it so that they run ads but the ad revenue that i have even though my views are up my subscriberships up the watch time is up the ads just seem to be stagnant or sometimes going the other way so that makes it all the more important to support the channel keep it coming for more of the UAP channel. Thank you. Bye for now.